Kitchen tools include everything related to cooking and food prep outside of the actual cooking equipment on the truck. A towel to keep your station looking cool, but most of all, you got to have your tool. Since every truck has different requirements, I'll just cover some general guidelines, starting with where you can shop and what to look for. If you have a restaurant supply store near you, like Jetro or Restaurant Depot, I would start there. Their prices will be competitive and you can test out a bunch of products in person. Number two, online restaurant supply sites like Webstaurant are another great option. Their selection will be at least as big as most restaurant supply stores. The downside is that shipping isn't always free and it can take a few days to get to you. You may also have to pay return fees and restocking fees if you decide not to keep something. Number three, big box stores like Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond should have most of the kitchen tools you need, but they probably won't have restaurant specific items. Also, unless there's a sale, prices won't be as competitive as other places. Number four, the kitchen section of department stores also will have a decent selection. But again, unless there's a sale or you have coupons, prices won't be as competitive as other places. Number five, there isn't anything you can't find these days on Amazon. Just make sure to compare prices. Pots and pans. Stainless steel is the most durable option, but it's more expensive and heavier than aluminum. Also, if your employees are very rough on handling and washing steel pots and pans, you may need to replace them almost as frequently as aluminum ones. If you need nonstick pans, don't buy expensive ones. They don't usually last much longer than cheaper nonstick pans, especially because you'll be using them much more frequently than people who cook at home. Plus, as I mentioned before, you can't always trust your employees to handle the pans carefully. You should expect to replace your nonstick pans at least every six months or when you start to see that the food is sticking or the outer layer starts peeling. Never use steel sponges on your pots and pans. They'll scratch the surfaces and peel away the nonstick coating on your nonstick pans. If there's any food stuck to your pots and pans, soak them in hot water or place them under running hot water as soon as you get back to commissary. After a few minutes, the food should be loose enough for you to use the rough side of a normal sponge to scrub it away. If you use nonstick pans, the same rule applies, but use non-scratch sponges instead of normal sponges. Never put cooking utensils in your pots and pans. At the end of service, lots of people will throw their dirty utensils, including knives, into empty pots that are lying around. Metal utensils can scratch the bottoms and sides of your pots and pans, so be very careful. Cooking utensils. Use stainless steel measuring cups and spoons. They're much more durable than plastic, and they won't become discolored or crack. Use silicone cooking utensils instead of plastic or metal for non-stick pots and pans. Silicone is more expensive than plastic, but it lasts longer and is much more heat resistant. If you accidentally leave a plastic spatula in a hot frying pan for a few seconds, it'll melt. Silicone, however, will just get hot. Silicone will also not scratch or damage your nonstick pots and pans like metal utensils will. Beware of utensils that are half silicone and half something else, like wood or plastic. To save money, many companies will make only the head of the utensil out of silicone and the handle out of another material. I wouldn't recommend using any wooden tools because wood can chip or crack pretty easily, and they can absorb colors and smells. Before silicone cooking utensils became popularized, wood was a good option because unlike metal, it would not scratch your pots and pans. And unlike plastic, it would not leach any chemicals into your food. But these days, there's basically no advantage that wood has over silicone, except maybe price. An electric knife sharpener is a great investment. A sharp knife is safer to use than a dull knife because it's less likely to slip when you're cutting something. The most common knife injury is from slipped knives cutting your finger or hand. Keep in mind that an electric knife sharpener is very different from a sharpening steel or honing steel. A honing steel is what chefs rub against their knives back and forth to make that swish swish sound. Super sharp knife, let the knife do the work. Super sharp, really important. A honing steel will only strain the edge of your knife, which means that if your knife is still pretty sharp, it'll keep it sharp. That's why you're supposed to hone it every two or four uses. However, if your knife has become dull, no amount of honing will make it sharp again. Ah yes, rusty and dull. Instead, you need to run it through an electric sharpener to actually shave off the dull edge and create a new sharp edge. Cutting boards. If you handle raw meat, have at least two cutting boards with different colors. One for raw meat, one for vegetables, and anything else. Make sure the cutting boards are plastic, non-porous, and if possible, NSF certified. Wood cutting boards are heavy, expensive, they can rot, and they're more prone to knife indentations. Have a designated drying rack or space for your washed cutting boards. Otherwise, they may become contaminated, discolored, and smelly. If any of your cutting boards come to have deep knife indentations or somehow become cracked, replace them immediately. Bacteria will start to form and your food will become contaminated. Gloves. There are generally two types of latex gloves, powdered and powder free. If you and your employees don't mind the powdered gloves, just use them year round. I personally don't like using them because of the white powder that it leaves on my hands, but powdered gloves are absolutely essential in the summer or in any place that's always hot. When you start sweating, it's almost impossible to get non-powdered gloves on your hands. 
There's no need to buy expensive gloves. Your employees will cycle through probably 10 pairs of gloves a day. Just make sure that the gloves you buy are compliant with your state's health codes. Containers. Clear plastic containers are great for most food storage requirements because they're inexpensive and you can see what's inside at all times. The disadvantage is that they're slightly less durable than metal containers. Also, if you store anything that's oily or has a strong smell, it may permanently stain the plastic. This isn't a worry with metal bins though. I would avoid using glass simply because it's heavy and it'll break if dropped or bumped into a hard surface. This is why you have plastic. Find a way to label the outside of the containers. It can be some masking tape and a Sharpie marker, or stickers specifically made for labeling food. There are even stickers that dissolve in water. Whichever method you use, make sure to write down the date that the food was prepared, by whom, and if necessary, when it's good until. After washing containers, find a way to dry the insides completely. If there's no place to air them out individually, wipe them down with paper towels or a clean washcloth. Bacteria can grow in puddled water. Other essentials include hair nets, a first aid kit that's stocked with bandages, burn cream or gel, a cold compress, alcohol, gauze, headache medicine, a digital scale for measuring ingredients, digital timers to measure cook times, extra batteries, food thermometers, a counterfeit money pen for anyone paying with a $50 or $100 bill, a tool kit for tightening screws, changing oil, etc., a car battery jump starter in case your truck battery dies but make sure that it's always fully charged. Plastic gas cans if you need to manually refill your generator. So this is actually the last chapter where I'll be adding startup costs to the end of the chapter. So for kitchen tools, we can figure on the low end, maybe $500 and on the high end, $1,500. I've also included a space for working capital. This is totally optional, but let me explain. Working capital means how much money you have reserved to ride out the first few months of business when things are still pretty slow and you're not making enough money yet to fully cover all of your expenses. A simple way to calculate how much working capital you'll need is to figure out how much money will go into paying all salaries for three months. So if you hire two employees and pay them and yourself $2,000 per month, you'll need $18,000 to cover three months of salaries. This means that in the worst case, you just need to sell enough food to pay for your commissary rents and insurance for the first three months until your business completely runs out of money. So this is the final tally of the total startup cost for your food truck. Keep in mind that these costs are only estimates and some of them are specific to New York City. For example, if you can legally get a mobile food vending permit in your city, you can subtract $6,000 for rent and security deposit from the low end estimate, which would make the total of $38,475. And you can subtract the $25,000 cost for a black market permit from the high end estimate, which would make the total $136,225.